I came here. People were asking, "Where are you going to teach on?" Well, I, okay, people were asking, "What are you going to teach on?" And I didn't even know what I'm going to teach on. I had lots of things prepared, and I didn't even know. I did not know what kind of group I was going to be teaching, where I should go, or what I, you know, what would be. Um, so I have a few uh, things. I'm probably going to teach on more than one thing. I'm going to actually pick some small things. Let's start with Matthew chapter five, verse seventeen. <clears throat> And we'll start some nice foundational stuff here from the ground up. Yeshua says, Think not that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one mute or one hook will pass away from the Torah until they all be fulfilled. There's actually a very interesting Midrash about this that appears in Midrash Rabbah three times. Uh, slightly different nuances in each version of the story, but the basic story is that, um, you know, according to the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 17, the king of Israel was obligated to write a Torah scroll out so that he would have uh, full knowledge of the entire Torah because he would have actually written it out himself. And as the Midrash goes, when Shlomo, Solomon, wrote out his copy of the Torah, and he got to the passage in Deuteronomy 17 that says that a king will not multiply, shall not multiply wives to himself, he left out a yud. A yud is the smallest Hebrew letter. And as a prefix to a verb, the yud uh, indicates what we call the imperfect form, which means that it's um, uh, an action that is still taking place. Okay, so that it means you know it, it, if uh, shall run is instead of uh, is running or has run, shall run. Okay. It's similar to tense. Hebrew doesn't have tense as we know it. The verbs are all perfect or imperfect. They either already completed, or they're or they're still ongoing. Okay, which is not necessarily the same thing as tense. For example, in English, we have both tense and perfect imperfect verbs. So we can say, "I was eating." Well, that's past tense, but an imperfect verb because. The verb is an ongoing action. Okay. The English lesson there. So, in the, uh, uh, in, the uh, um, uh, in, in the Hebrew, the imperfect form is indicated by a yud at the beginning of the verb. And so Solomon left out the yud. So instead of saying that he shall not... Uh, have multiply the king shall not multiply wives to himself. It says the king has not multiplied wives to himself, or does not. Multiply. In other words, the, the king does not multiply a lot wives to himself. Meaning that no matter, on the one hand, with the yud, it means don't do it. You shall not multiply wives to yourself. But without the yud, it means. The king can't do it. No matter how many wives he has, he hasn't multiplied wives to himself. So the difference this one little letter makes. He explains a little bit about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the the Yud, according to the, the Midrash, ascended up to Elohim and says, you can't let this get, go by. If one Yud can be removed from the Torah, the entire to Torah is vulnerable. And so, the, as the Midrash goes, the Yud was restored to the Torah, and Elohim declared in the Midrash that not one Yud or one Vav would pass from the Torah. And very similar language here. Okay, so Yeshua is referring to the Midrash that they all know. Okay, but I want to look at the verse. Well, in fact, 
and it's actually very interesting because then it goes, and whoever shall abolish one of the least of these commandments uh, and shall uh, teach the sons of men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall keep one of the least of these commandments shall teach the men of men, uh, son of men so, the same will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will not come into the kingdom of heaven. Which is kind of interesting because a lot of people that down uh, the the Pharisees, okay, Yeshua says you have to be what more righteous than the Pharisees, not less righteous, not oh the right they're all just you know, no that's not what he what he says here. Um, so he actually is describing a very high level of righteousness. Not only that, those that understand verse uh, 17 to mean that Yeshua fulfilled the Torah, so I don't have to. We have heard that. Okay. Now, he fulfilled the Torah for me. Here's the problem with that. Can a woman say that Yeshua fulfilled the Torah commandments by being washed after his menstruation period? So I don't have to. Possible. Possible. Okay. And there's many other Torah commandments that only apply to the high priest, or only apply to the Levites, or only apply to women. Yeshua didn't. Hold on to your hats. Yeshua didn't keep the whole Torah. It's impossible. Okay? <laughs> he, kept, he, he never violated Torah. There's a big difference. But he didn't keep the whole Torah because there were a lot of commandments in the Torah that never applied to him. Okay? <laughs> Some of them only apply to lepers. Some of them only apply to you get the picture. So um, uh, what Yeshua did do is he never violated the Torah. He kept the Torah without ever violating it. Okay, so the whole ideology then that Yeshua kept the Torah so I don't have to falls apart. It doesn't work. Okay. Second of all, that's not really what fulfill means. And if I fill my gas tank, does that mean... So I throw the gas tank away, I don't need it anymore? I don't ever, no. Okay? Okay? So what Yeshua goes on in the following verses to do is he goes line by line through passages of Torah. And I wrote a blog about this recently. He builds a fence around the Torah, which is actually um, the, the, in the Talmud of vote 1-1. Uh, it talks about how the Torah was passed through from from Moshe to Joshua, from Joshua to the elders, from the elders to uh, um, the men of the great assembly, which were the, was the assembly that we read about in Ezra and Nehemiah that was established. And they gave certain instructions. And one of the instructions that they gave, the tidbits of advice, if you will, was build a fence around the Torah. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that again in a minute, but build a fence around the Torah. Um, and so what Yeshua does is he's about to go through here and go through one commandment after another and build a front fence around that commandment. Okay. Classic example in the Torah, in the in the, uh, the Talmud of building a fence around the Torah, is in the first, very first Mishnah that is debated in the Talmud or discussed in the Talmud, and that is in, in Tractate Berachot, which deals with blessings, with the prayers. And um, we know that from Torah that we have uh, uh, we recite the Shema in the morning, in the morning and in the evening, or as the Torah actually says, when you lie down and when you rise up. And so the Torah, uh, the, the the first issue the Talmud takes up is one: what time is that actually referring to? When you lie down and when you rise up. Um, and then the next issue that it talks about is, does it literally mean I have to lie down <laughs> to say the morning shema and stand up to say the evening shema? And uh, um, some may may find interesting that the house of shema I said, no, you actually have to lay down. So they take the verse literally. Very literal, right. literally. And the house of Hill all said, no, no, it's the it's basically the spirit of the Torah that's what it means is. It's not a matter of whether you lie down or whether you stand up. It's that you say it and mean it. It's the, the intent of the heart that is important there. But I'm 
chasing a little rabbi trail. Backing up to the, the, the first part of that little discussion. The first part of the discussion is about the timing of when we say the, the Shema. The e it starts with the evening Shema. When we say the evening Shema. And um, obviously we're supposed to say it in the evening. And the conclusion of the, the discussion is ultimately that you're supposed to say it before midnight. But if you haven't said it before dawn, you're still obligated to say it. Which means, in fact, it goes on to say, well, why, if you're still supposed to say it until dawn, do the rabbis say that you're supposed to say it before midnight? And the answer is to keep man away from sin. In other words, they're building a fence around the Torah. If my parents tell me to be in by midnight, and I say, well, you know, if I try to be in by midnight and I show up at 12.01, I'm in trouble. So maybe I should try, you know, try and be in by 11.45. Just like those of you maybe who you have to be at work, clocked in by 8 a.m. So you shoot for 7.45. So, so builds a fence around the Torah. So Yeshua then, in this section of Matthew, says, well, the Torah says you shall not murder. Okay. I'm telling you, don't even be angry with your brother. Because if you're not angry with your brother, you're not likely to want to kill him. <laughs> don't, the Torah says don't commit adultery. But I'm going to tell you, don't even look at a woman with lust in your eye, because if you're not doing that, step one, then you're not going to go commit adultery. You see the, the defensive protection around the Torah. Um, and then uh, um, it says, write this if you want to get divorced. You have to write the woman a bill of divorcement according to the Torah. He says, but really, you shouldn't get divorced unless, divorce, unless there's a matter of adultery. So it's not enough just to write the bill of divorcement. You know, there needs to be a cause. And then the, the Torah says not to forswear yourself, not to not to, uh, to keep your vows. And so the Torah says to keep your vows. But Yeshua says, don't make vows. So if you don't make a vow, you don't have to worry about keeping it. Okay? And layer of protection. Go ahead. I was going to say that, I mean, that's found in the Bible itself. But right? they say, isn't it, isn't it Solomon himself in Ecclesiastes, I think, that says, like, be very careful about what you come out because you're sworn to fulfill it or something like that? I don't, yeah. know, I don't know. I know there was an Essene practice not to take oaths. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, know. I think, I think Dave recently actually sent out something from the Talmud I didn't know about before uh, on that very issue. So yeah, apparently there is a nice Talmudic uh, yeah, I, I just, it, parallel. It, 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 I mean, the Talmud is over 5,000 pages, so I don't have it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> you may find something in Talmud I didn't find. Yeah. 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 Um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What does that mean? That does not mean okay, the Sadducees well, let's talk for a moment about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We'll talk some more about this. Well, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were three sects of Judaism in the first century, three major sects. They were, anybody? Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. And what was, we'll talk about the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees here because they're the ones that get talked about a lot in the New Testament. Interestingly, the Essenes don't get that much attention. There may be a reason for that, too. Um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees differed because the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife. Period. The end. Okay? Um, what happened was there was a, there was a leader of Israel... Um, named Antigonus of Soko. Antigonus of Soko was a student of Simon the Righteous. Simon the Righteous was the last remnant of the Great Assembly. Um, Antigonus of Soko had 
a teaching may sound familiar to you because it sounds very Pauline. He says, we do not observe Torah as one who is seeking to be, as a servant who is seeking to be paid. But as a servant who has no, no mind of a reward. And may the fear of Elohim be upon you. So he says, we're not, we're not trying to earn anything. Well, you can't earn anything by keeping Torah. We're not trying to earn our salvation by keeping Torah. Does this not sound like Paul? This is, this is actually the foundation of Phariseeism. But a lot of people don't know what Phariseeism is. Okay? So they, they think Phariseeism is all kinds of things that they've had dri driven into their mind by the church. Um, that are not based on actual source, first, you know, primary source documents about Phariseeism. Now, Antigonus of Soko had a student who was named Zadok. And this student was not a really good student. <laughs> this student, um, um, he misinterpreted Antigonus. And so his understanding was that since we don't keep the Torah as one who's trying to earn a reward, it must not be a reward. There is no afterlife. That's what it means. Yes. Yes. And so he went off, uh, yes, Antigonus, like Paul's words, were difficult to understand and easily twisted and misunderstood. And they were Pauline-like words. So this began, Zadok began a new sect, which were called the Zadokim. Or Sadducees. Okay? The other uh, students of Antigonus of Soko went on to be uh, to be the first of Beit Din and Nasi. Those are the two leaders, the Zugot, or the pairs of leaders of the Pharisaic Sanhedrin that was set up to replace the at this point defunct assembly of uh, Great Assembly that was set up by Ezra and Nehemiah. So we have at this particular point in time with Antigonus of Soko, the, the genesis of the division between Pharisees and Sadducees. And the core issue was that the Sadducees did not believe in the afterlife. Now, if you don't believe in the afterlife, then to make it stick, there was a problem for, Antig for uh, Zadok. The problem Zadok faced is that Judaism didn't teach that there was no afterlife. It never taught that there was no afterlife. Okay? And so um, uh, it was a tradition, if you can learn to stand that word, there was a tradition in Judaism that there is, in fact, an afterlife. <laughs> okay? And so uh, um, in order to uh, evade that, Zadok says... Well, we got, we, in other words, if he's going to reject the idea that there's an afterlife, he also had to reject the traditions of the fathers because the traditions of the fathers was that there was an afterlife. So Zadok basically, Zadok basically said, there is no afterlife. Show me in the Torah where it mentions an afterlife. In the written Torah. Forget the traditions of our fathers. Show me in the written Torah that there's an afterlife. This, thus, uh, Zadok and his followers, the Zadokim, rejected the traditions of the fathers as well as the idea of an afterlife. Now, you can go to Daniel and show a resurrection, and you can go to Isaiah and show a resurrection, but in the Torah, you can't, at least in the plain meaning of the Torah, show that there's an afterlife. Okay. Now, there is a debate in the Talmud between the rab uh, that the rabbis bring up trying to show that you can demonstrate through um, extraordinary interpretive means from passages of the Torah that there's an afterlife. By the way, it's for the same reason that there's so much conflict about the afterlife in the movement. Between the, well, you know, what happens in the afterlife? Are you conscious, unconscious, this or that? Because it's all a matter of Jewish tradition. So if you don't have Jewish tradition, you can only do one thing. Yes. 
Okay. When the Worldwide Church of God, for example, the old Worldwide Church of God under Garm uh, Herbert W. Armstrong, started uh, keeping the feasts, they didn't know what to do. Some of the feasts had some information about them, but other ones didn't have much information in their written text about what to do for the feasts, so they had to start making stuff up and creating customs. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm kind of getting getting ahead of myself. Let's well let's 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 follow this. We'll come back to this, but let's follow this rabbit trail for a little bit. Um, talking about Pharisees and Sadducees. Let's talk to uh, let's turn to uh, Acts 23. Acts 23, starting in verse um, 1. When, you, when Paul looked on their assembly, he said, Men, my brothers, in all good conscience, I have conducted myself before Eloah up to this day. And Hananiah the Kohen commanded those who were standing by his side that they should strike Paul upon his mouth. Now, yeah, let's, let's pause for a moment here. You have to understand, this is the first century, second temple era. Who chooses, where, what, the, the, the high priest at the time, where did they come from? Were they, does anybody know where the high priests of the first century came from? Bought in. They were, they were, the high priesthood had become an office controlled by the Roman Empire that if you paid a high enough bribe to the officials, you could get the office. You didn't even have to be a Levite. Um, I hadn't heard it. However, Herod was an Edomite, and uh, but he was an Edomite convert. Sincerity of his conversion is <laughs> That's, yes, debatable. But uh, okay, so um, uh, my my point here is that. We must understand that this high priest was not legit. Okay, he was not legit. Going back, it was actually during the time of the Maccabees uh, that, uh, um, well, after the Maccabees again, the Roman Empire was selling the priesthood to the highest bidder. This is going to help us give some context to what Paul says, because it's as all usual, Paul gets misinterpreted. Paul said to him. Eloah shall strike you, whited wall. Now, what is a whited wall? Anybody know? It's actually a term that, that appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, uh, uh, the Essenes used it um, to describe hypocrites. And um, they, used it in the, they also used another term that may be familiar to you, brood of vipers to describe hypocrites. In other words, the wall's just white on the outside. The inside, it's all gross. Okay? You've whited wall. And are you sitting that you are judging me according to the Torah while you are transgressing concerning the Torah and commanding that they should smite me? And those who were standing there said to him, Are you reviling the Kohen of Eloah. Now, this is where you have to understand the whole context of this to what Paul says next. Paul said to them, I didn't know, my brothers, that he was the Kohen, for it is written, you shall not curse a leader of your people. Paul wasn't saying this, saying, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. What he was saying is, really? I didn't know he was the Kohen. Really? You really think he's the Kohen? Okay. Verse 6. And as Paul knew that some of the people were of the Zadokim, Sadducees, and others were of the perishing Pharisees, he cried out in the assembly, Men, my brothers, I am what? I am a Pharisee. Present tense. 
I am a Pharisee. You know, when I first became a believer in Messiah 30 years ago, um, in the first couple of years afterwards, uh, a friend of a friend was a guy uh, named Dr. Mel Couch. And Couch had started a seminary down in Texas, which has flourished and grew, and it's actually a big well-known seminary now called Tyndale Bible Theological Seminary. And he encouraged me um, uh, to, he was friends of the leader of the Messianic congregation that I was attending at the time, to come study in his seminary. He wanted his, I want to hear your, your inputs from your Jewish perspective on things. So we're in class, and, and there's class discussion going on, and we're going back and forth with the discussion, and he's getting starting to get heated and angry and upset. And he says, the way you're talking, you think Paul was a Pharisee. So I went right here, and I said, as he said, I'm a Pharisee. <laughs> That's it. I want to see you after class. <laughs> after class, I was told I was no longer allowed to participate in any class discussions, and that was the last time I showed up for that seminary. So. But this is a passage that people... A lot of people have a problem with. Because Paul said, I am a Pharisee. I thought Pharisees were the devil. No. Paul was a Pharisee. And then he says, the son of a Pharisee, of the son of Pharisees, and concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Well, now the commentaries really get confused. What is Paul saying now? Is he saying, we said that the big division between Pharisees and Sadducees was the resurrection of the dead, right? So is Paul saying, is he lying? Because that's not what he's there for, right? That's not what the problem he's having with them is over. He's declaring Yeshua as the Messiah. That's what the problem is, right? But he's kind of he's shifting the subject and playing them against each other. That's the way the commentary seemed to, to play it. Just comes up out of the blue with this and says, nah, it's really because I'm a Pharisee. <laughs> That's the problem here. And they don't like the resurrection of the dead, so they're 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 picking on me. That's not what's happening here. It's, it's not even really what's transpiring. And so uh, what is transpiring? Well, Paul is questioning the authenticity of the Kohen. Because the Kohen's a Sadducee, and he doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Okay? Not only is he calling into question the legitimacy of the Kohen, but... Paul's own teaching about Yeshua does, in fact, tie into the resurrection of the dead issue. So, let's all turn to Sanhedrin. <laughs> in the Mishnah, tractate Sanhedrin 11.1. 1. And I know you don't have it, I'm just, just kidding. Okay, first of all, you couldn't carry a Talmud around with you because it's like a set of encyclopedias. In, in size. Anyway, um, there is a, um, uh, in this Mishnah, Sanhedrin 11.1, 1, it starts out and it says, this may sound familiar to you because it also parallels something Paul says, all Israel has a part in the world to come. What does Paul say that's almost identical to that? All Israel will be saved, Romans 11. Okay? All Israel will be saved. In fact, Paul is, is speaking oral Torah. He's, he's referencing what was then oral, the, the idea all Israel has a part in the world to come. Now, this, uh, this particular section of Mishnah then follows with what would almost seem like a contradiction. It says, these have no part in the world to come, and then it starts to, to list off those that have no part in the world to come. And... One of the lists, one of the one of the, uh, I, the first items in the list of those that have no part in the world to come, is 
those who say that the resurrection of the dead is a teaching that is not found in Torah. In other words, the Sadducees. Okay? Now, this is a, important in Sanhedrin because Sanhedrin has to determine to whom Jewish law applies. Okay? Because some people are considered under the authority of the court and some people are not under the authority of the court because they're not part of Am Yisrael. Okay? And so, um, and so this is really the classic who is a Jew argument <laughs> from an Orthodox Jewish perspective, if you will. All Israel has a part in the world to come. By the way, the Mishnah goes on to talk about the lost tribes and some things that parallel the idea of grafting in. And so it, it very well fits what Paul, there's a whole new different study we could do on Romans 11 and how it ties in with, with the uh, Talmud here. But what I want to get to here is that the Talmud then begins many, many pages of discussion about the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Demonstrating trying to show that it exists in Torah in one way or another. And then we get to page um, 96b, towards the bottom of the page, and it says, said Rabbi Nachman to Rabbi Isaac, have you heard when the son of the fallen one will come? And he said, who is the son of the fallen one? He said, it's the Messiah. He says, why do you call the Messiah the fallen one? He says, ah, because it's written... On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, the fallen one. Amos 9.11. He said, this is what Rabbi Yochanan said, the generation to which the son of David will come will be the one in which the disciples and the sages are fewer. It goes on, but the, what I want to key on, on here is that um, there is in the Gemara to this Mishnah teaches that Amos 9.11 refers, is a messianic prophecy. Oh, there's so much important stuff right there. Uh, there's a, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls mentions Amos 9.11, implies it's a messianic prophecy too. But here it is in the Talmud. Why? Why is it a messianic prophecy? What is the context? The context here is the resurrection of the dead. Okay? So if the rabbis are saying here, in this section of Gemara, if the rabbis are saying that the, uh, Amos 9.11 is talking about the Messiah, it's talking about the tabernacle of David, i.e. the body of the Messiah, being risen up because it has fallen down, what is the context of risen up in this resurrection? So here we have the doctrine of the resurrection of the Messiah in the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that the Messiah dies and is resurrected. Well, in fact, this is why this gets cited in Acts chapter 15. Yeah, exactly. Acts chapter 15 references the, uh, uh, the tabernacle of David which has fallen. And a lot of people, why does it say that? Well, it's refer. It's referring to the fact that the Messiah recently was resurrected, was died and was resurrected. Okay. So Paul's saying, I've been teaching that the Messiah is going to die and res be resurrected. And that is a Pharisaic doctrine, a Pharisaic teaching. Not only that, because that is in the Gemara, so it means it's an extension of the idea that, you have, that all Israel... Um, must believe in the doctrine of the resurrection, and by extension that Amos 9.11 is talking about the resurrection of the Messiah. Okay? So Paul is very much in order now, saying, I'm running around teaching Amos 9.11 and the resurrection of the dead. And not only that, the resurrection of the Messiah. The death and resurrection of the Messiah. That's what this is all about, and this guy that's ordered them to hit me, doesn't believe Amos 9-11, doesn't believe in the resurrection of the Messiah, doesn't believe in the resurrection at all, and by the way, under our Pharisaic law, he's not even part of Am Yisrael. 
So is he really the high priest? <laughs> so now that we understand that, let's reread this part. And those who were standing, uh, let's back up. And Paul said to them, Eloa shall strike, strike you whited wall. And what are you sitting that you are judging me according to the Torah while you are transgressing concerning the Torah and commanding that they should smite me? And those who were standing there said to him, are you reviling the Kohen of Eloah? And his answer is no. He said, he said, basically, in sarcasm. See, Paul uses a little sarcasm here. There's other places he uses sarcasm, by the way. Paul said, oh, I didn't know he was the high priest. Really? Because he didn't even believe in the resurrection. I didn't know, my brothers, that he was the Kohen. For it is written, you should not curse the leader of your people. And then he says, um, uh, men, my brothers. Now, if you skip the narrative, go right to his next statement, as if you were there and you didn't have a narrator narrating. He goes right from, you shall not curse the leader of your people. Men, my brothers, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged. You see what I'm saying? He said, He's no high priest. He's a Sadducee. He doesn't even believe in the resurrection. He's not even, he doesn't even have a part in the world to come. He's therefore not part of Am Yisrael. Because all of Am Yisrael is a part in the world to come. And he doesn't. He doesn't even believe in the world to come. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> um, so anyway, that's kind of what's transpiring here. I want to back up now back to Matthew chapter 5. To our original verse, Matthew five seventeen. Think not that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. This is actually referring back to, and we'll turn back to the Torah now, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And there's probably 10 or 15 different versions of the Bible here. So, Deuteronomy chapter 12. We should probably say Deuteronomy chapter 13. That's probably the way to do this. Deuteronomy 13. Okay. Now, if you're using a Jewish version or the original Hebrew or a version that follows the original Hebrew, we're looking at chapter 13, verse 1. Okay? If you're using a quote-unquote Christian Bible or a Bible that's not following the Hebrew text, we're actually looking at chapter 12, verse 32. Okay. So it's going to make a difference. Beware, your Bible may have the versification differently. If you've got the Hebraic Roots version, we've got them both there. If you have St uh, David Stern's Jewish New Testament, I think he has both sets of versification, one in the parentheses or whatever. But it um, says, All this word which I command you shall you observe to do, you shall not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Everybody find that verse, whether it's uh, the last verse of chapter 12 and the first verse of chapter 13, you can find it. Now, there's a reason that the Christian editions splits it up and moves this verse to the end of chapter 12 and puts a chapter division between it. Okay? Because the monks monkeyed with the text. <laughs> okay? They wanted to break up the, the sense of it. Okay? Because the text goes on to say, If there arise in the midst of you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, whereof he speaks unto you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, 
let us serve them, you shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your Elohim puts you to proof to know whether you do love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. <clears throat> After Yahweh your Elohim shall you walk, and him shall you fear, and that's not like boo, I'm scared, fear. That's awe kind of fear. Um, and his commandments shall you keep, and unto his voice shall you hearken, and him shall you serve, and unto him shall you cleave. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken perversion against Yahweh your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to draw you aside out of the way which Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to walk in, so shall you put away the evil from the midst of you. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, let's go back up to the beginning. All this word which I command you, uh, shall you observe to do, you shall not add thereto nor diminish from it. You can see that the following verses are elaborating on that verse, right? But that's bad news for Christianity because the rest of the verses tell us something that they don't want to accept, and we'll move. And we'll explain why in a minute. So they've got to move that verse up and break it off from the sense, and have verse two, one in some of your versions, start a whole new idea. So if I'm understanding correctly, the Bible has it has that verse not spaced from chapter Right. Okay, so now, so we have the command here not to add to the Torah or take from the Torah, which is what Yeshua is referencing in Matthew chapter 5, saying, don't think I came to do this, because if he did come to do that, would he be the Messiah? No, he couldn't be the Messiah, because he'd be violating Torah. In fact, as we're going to continue to find here, what would Deuteronomy 13 require us to do if Yeshua, well, he's already dead. But, but but apart from that, what would Matt, and, and of course, we'd have to have a theocracy and other things, you know, we don't do that. But but what else would Matthew, what does uh, Deuteronomy 13 require us, to, would require us to do? Not listen to him. We would be required by Deuteronomy 13 to reject him. Am I right? Isn't that what the text says? And Deuteronomy 13 was given before anything else, so you have to start here. This is your anchor point, right? You don't start with the New Testament and work your way back. You start with the Torah and you work your way forward. And the Torah says anybody comes along and adds to or takes from the Torah, don't listen to them. Reject them. You're required to reject. It's not even an option, okay? Um, and it's going to happen because I'm going to let. I'm going to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Okay, so now Orthodox Jews, okay, many of the Jewish people have rejected the Jesus that they have been presented with. But that Jesus is the Jesus that came to free you from the bondage of the law. They rejected him. Should they have? Yes. The Torah required them to reject that Jesus. They did the right thing in rejecting that Jesus. The problem is... Most of them have never heard of the actual true Yeshua that was the incarnation of Torah. That was, okay? There's a story that, um, uh, an interesting little story, true story, I know because a friend of mine, an old friend of mine was there. There was a breakfast prayer meeting, an interfaith breakfast prayer meeting in Israel um, like 30, 40 years ago. And a famous Baptist preacher named W. W. E. Chriswell, W. A. Chriswell. Anyway, uh, Chriswell Bible Institute, all that stuff was there, and um, Rabbi Ben Gurion was there. And uh, Chriswell says to Ben Gurion, he says, "What are you going to do when the Messiah comes and it's Jesus?" And Rabbi Gurion says. 
I really wouldn't have a problem with that. He goes, but what are you going to do when Jesus returns and he's an Orthodox Jew? <laughs> okay, so the Torah then is very clear here. Now, what does it mean to add to the Torah? Let, let's let's kind of elaborate on that because some people don't really necessarily really understand what it means to add from the to the Torah. We're going to talk about subtracting from the Torah here in a minute. But what does it mean to add to the Torah? Some people will say, well, the oral Torah adds to the Torah. There's two problems with that. One, it's circular thinking. Let me explain what I mean. If Moshe did in fact receive an, a written Torah and an oral Torah, or oral and written components to the Torah, if you will, on Mount Sinai, then the oral Torah was always an organic part of the Torah. So when Moshe comes down from Mount Sinai and he says, don't go out of your place on the Shabbat, and Shlomo on the first row raises his hand and he says, what does that mean? Moshe didn't shr shrug his shoulders and say, heck if I know. <laughs> he told him what that meant, which means our forefathers knew what these things meant. Okay, And then they passed that information. The same forefathers that passed the written Torah down to us through the generations pass the oral Torah through the generations with it. Why should we reject one and accept the other? Well, Zadok had a good reason. You couldn't reject the afterlife if you were going to accept the written, the oral tradition, because the oral tradition says that there is an afterlife. Um, there were no Kairites in the first century, by the way. That was a, that first, the Kairite movement began in the Middle Ages. It actually began in the Middle Ages believe it or not, inspired by, anybody know? Islam, yes. Um, about this, in the Middle Ages, Islam went through a crisis over tradition in Islam, and a group of Muslims came out called Quranists. And Quranists said, and this may sound familiar, basically sola scripta. It's the Quran and the Quran only. <laughs> there is no no tradition should be added to the Quran. Our Islam should be based only on the Quran. And they became very critical of any traditions. And um, as a result, there were a group of Jews that were living in the Islamic world that were trying to fit in and get along. And so they rejected Jewish tradition as well. No, we're just like you. It's the Bible and the Bible only, the Torah and the Torah only. And um, there was a little bit more to it than that, but that was really the... And so they they said, we're, we're Karaites. Now you have to understand the word Quran comes from the Arabic word Qura, which means... Is he, huh? Re reading or reciting or calling out. And, any of those, it's ambiguous, it can mean any of those things. And the Hebrew word kara means the same thing. Okay, now the Quran is called the Quran because as the story goes, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to, did this happen? Was it demonic or was it you know, invention or whatever? But as the story goes, Moshe heard a voice. I mean, Moshe, heaven forbid. <laughs> Moshe did hear a voice, but. Muhammad, yes, Muhammad, <laughs> okay, Muhammad supposedly hears the voice that says, recite, or in Arabic, Qur'a, or Quran, Quran. And so he recited, ultimately, what the, in fact, at first he thought it was a demon, maybe it was, and he went to go get counseling from others, is this a demon, is it not a demon? And ultimately, he supposedly decided it wasn't a demon. And, and, and I don't want to get into teaching Islam here, okay? I'm just uh, using this as an illustration. Okay, so, um, but that's why the Quran became called the Quran, and why the Quranic movement became the Quranic movement, based on the Quran and the Quran only, and why the Kairite movement became known as the Kairite movement, as a spin off of the Quranic movement. And then as the Middle Ages pro progressed into 
the, the Age of Enlightenment and the Renaissance, a group of Christians became interested, fascinated with this Jewish Karite teaching of the scripture and the scripture only, and they tried to implement it into Christianity, and we found the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation may have made some positive contribution in, in a positive direction away from Catholicism, don't get me wrong, but its roots can actually be traced to the Karites and the Quranists and Islam. Okay? Okay, so, first of all, the Oral Torah is not is not an addition to Torah if it was always a natural, organic, integral part of the Torah from the very beginning. You have to start a circular thinking process of assuming it's not, and then in assuming it's not, saying, there, see, it's an addition. Why is it an addition? Because it wasn't there before. Why wasn't it there before? Because you don't add to the Torah. You see the circular thinking? Chasing their own tail. Okay. Um, there's two aspects of the Oral Torah. Part of the Oral Torah is Oral Torah from Sinai. Oral Torah from Sinai is material, because Moshe was up on Mount Sinai how long? 40 days. Have you ever gotten like Bible on tape or anything like that? Anybody listen to the Bible on tape? Did it take you 40 days? How about the five books of Moses? Probably, what, a day? So is that all Moshe received in 40 days? <laughs> no way. Moshe received much more information than that over a period. In fact, Moshe was, according to the Midrash, Moshe was so enjoying learning all the Torah from from. Uh, Elohim during the 40 days and studying and asking questions and learning more, you know, as you can imagine you would be, he didn't want to come down. He did not want to come down. And Elohim says, you need to come down. It's time to go. He didn't want to go. Elohim basically says, um, I'll be fine without you. <laughs> I've gotten along for a very long time without you. <laughs> I'll get by. <laughs> you need to go. <laughs> okay, so um, there's another element of, to of oral Torah, which is not oral Torah from Sinai. It's the rulings that were made by the judges that shall be in those days, and that's actually in the Torah too. Um, let's follow the, the rabbi trail here. In uh, Deuteronomy 17. We'll come back to chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 17, starting in verse 3. Nope. Verse uh, 8, sorry. If there arise a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, even matters of controversy within your gates, then shall you arise and get you up onto the place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. And you shall come onto the Kohanim, the Levites, and onto the judge that shall be in those days. And you shall inquire and they shall declare unto you the sentence of judgment. So here it's talking about the council of elders. It's talked about in other passages in uh, Matthew chapter 18, I mean, Matthew chapter, well, toward Matthew chapter 18, 18, but uh, I meant Exodus chapter 18 and other passages. Okay. And you shall do according to the tenor of the sentence which they shall declare unto you from that place which Yahweh shall choose, and you shall observe to do according to all that they teach you. Verse 11 is key. Everybody may have different translations here, so I'm going to read from the HRV. The HRV actually leaves a certain key word in the Hebrew that makes a very profound point. Verse 11. According to the Torah, 
which they shall teach you, and according to the judgment which they shall tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the sentence which they shall declare unto you to the right hand nor to the left. So what does the Torah say that the rulings that this body makes are? Torah. According to Torah. According to written Torah, the rulings that this body makes are Torah. Are they added to the Torah? No. They are. They're, they're Torah because the Torah says that they're Torah. And the man that does presumptuously in not hearkening on to the Kohen that stands to minister there before Yahweh your Elohim or on to the judge, so it doesn't have to be Kohen, even that man shall die and you shall exterminate the evil from Israel. So what was the penalty for not following the Torah that came from this body? In every case, right? So what was the penalty for eating pork? No, it wasn't death. You were just unclean until eat. I can name you any number of commandments that you could that are from the written Torah that you could violate, and the penalty was not death. So it's interesting that you can violate certain written commandments in the written Torah. And the penalty is lesser than violating the Torah that comes from this body. <laughs> okay? The Talmud actually talks about this point. It's the irony of it, of it, okay? From a Talmudic, from a rabbinic standpoint, where they would recognize the Sanhedrin of Yavne in Jerusalem, for example, it says, look, if you don't wear tefillin when you pray, it's okay. I mean, there's a penalty. I don't remember what the penalty is for that, but it's not death. Okay? If you wear tefillin that don't fit, meet the, the, uh, uh, the standards that are set up by the, by the councils, the penalty was death. <laughs> so you could not wear tefillin at all, and that was one thing. But if you wore bad tefillin, <laughs> that was... <laughs> that was... Okay? Well, in Judges, what was the worst? What was the worst time in Israel? What each man did as he saw was right in his own eyes. Exactly. Okay. No. So backing up to Deuteronomy chapter 13 again. That's not adding to the Torah. Those are not additions to the Torah. Um. <clears throat> Now, there's also another issue, and that is we talked about building a fence around the Torah. So if the Torah says, um, say the Shema in the evening, therefore, before sunrise, and we say, yeah, well, you, you say the Shema before midnight. That way you know you're not going to, you know. Uh, or the Torah says, you will not murder, and Yeshua says, don't even hate, don't even be angry, actually, don't be angry, then... Um, is that adding to the Torah? No, that's not adding to the Torah because it's not Torah, it's not presented as Torah. The fence is not presented as Torah. If I build a fence around my house, do I add to my house? No, don't add to my house. I just protect my house. Exactly. Okay. The fence isn't part of my house, and nobody mistakes the fence for part of my house. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. It's a good question. Okay. There, um, and Yeshua talks about this, and also the Talmud talks about this. <laughs> Not that particular issue, but in general. Can the judges make a declaration that conflicts with the actual Torah, with the written Torah, or even with the oral Torah from Sinai? And the answer is no. Well, yes. Um, Here's a um, um, a I'm trying to do a good example. Um, if the judge, okay, 
if the judges say that, well, Yeshua addresses it in Matthew chapter 15. Perfect. Matthew chapter 15 is all about that. Uh, a decree from the elders that conflicts with the written Torah. Okay? Uh, the decree from the elders says, you know, do X, and the Torah says you can't, you know, not to do X, then obviously that is invalid. Okay? And the Yeshua's decision on that in Matthew chapter 15 actually has a direct parallel in the, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, where the Mishnah comes to the same basic conclusion. If you make a vow, for example, to eat pork, it's not a valid vow. You don't eat pork. Okay? So, um, and, and realize, let me elaborate what I, my, my, myself. I don't believe that modern Orthodox rabbinic Judaism holds that authority. I don't believe that the council, okay. after Yeshua was crucified, even shortly before he was crucified, in Matthew chapter 18, Yeshua transferred that authority to his own emissaries. And he says in Matthew chapter 18, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Those terms bind and loose are idiomatic expressions that are used in Judaism and the Talmud. If you prohibit, if the court prohibits an activity, then they, they are said to have bound it. And if they permit an activity, they are said to have loosed it. Okay? They, yes, and that's what we see happening in Acts chapter 15. There's a halachic issue that comes up, and the council, the council of, of elders and emissaries resolves the halachic issue. Yes? Well, I find interesting that in Acts 15, it says that there were Pharisees who believed that kings and seen uh, Honor the court. Hold the court in authority. They, in fact, they showed up. Yeah. yeah. They held mm -hmm. the, that court in more authority than the court of the regular. Well, there, there was some blurring at this time because Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer, who was the sixth most cited sage in the Mishnah, was a Nazarene. <laughs> so, um, and he got fed up with the Pharisaic court. So that's. <laughs> um, uh, Who mm -hmm. Kiva? Yeah. Yeah, Kiva was the off bait dean. Well, they had also stolen that which was hectish, that which was um, the same sin as uh, Aiken. Okay. Um, okay. So, that's adding to the Torah. We don't add to the Torah. Class example of, of adding to the Torah is the works of the law. The works of the law, you've probably heard the phrase, Paul uses it in, Gen in Galatians and in Romans. But it's actually a phrase that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls because there was a radical sect of Essenes. The Essenes themselves believed that the Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees, the Essenes didn't reject the oral law. They made it harder. Right? They said, <laughs> Pharisaic, they referred to the Pharisaic uh, law and the Pharisaic uh, wall as a shoddy wall. And they said, uh, um, you know, they're just, they're, 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 oh, like, for example, the Pharisee said, if, if it's Sabbath and somebody's life is in danger, you, the Sabbath is loosed to save the person's life. The Essenes said, nah, if there's a man drowning, let him drown. It's better to let him drown on the Sabbath than it is to use a tool to rescue him. Yeah, I thought that was another group, actually, of early Kairites, because they were like, based on 
going out of your place on the Sabbath or something. But I could, I could be wrong on that. It could be the, I don't know. But the point is that the Essenes, okay, the Essenes had this document called 4QMMT that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls called, uh, the document itself is titled, Some of the Works of the Law. And, and uh, in this document, the author of 4QMMT, the author of Some of the Works of the Law, so he uh, refers to Abraham, refers to being these works of the law as being reckoned to you as righteousness. Exactly the opposite terminology that Paul uses when he talks about the works of the law. And what these works of the law is, is a number of, of halakhic rulings that have been made by the Pharisees that the Essenes said, no, nah, not strict enough. They're polluting the temple with their weak halakha. It should actually be over here. You know, it's actually be, you know, this much harder and this much, you know, um, and so that's what Paul's railing against in in Galatians, the works of the law, these these hyper purity regulations that were that were adding to they were adding to the Torah that were way above and beyond the the uh, uh, even the oral Torah. Okay, okay. So on the one hand, you have the one extreme, the works of the law, uh, uh, and the adding to the Torah. On the other hand, you have the other extreme, those who subtract from the Torah or detract from the Torah, which, of course, is modern Christianity. The Torah has been done away with, okay? And the, their understanding of Paul, okay? Any passage, when I get into discussions with Christians, oftentimes they'll pull open something from Paul, from Ephesians or something, they'll say, see, right there, Paul says blah, blah, blah. And they, they don't understand the debate. They don't understand the foundations of the argument. If they're right, they're still wrong. In other words, if they could absolutely prove that Paul was saying the law had been done away with, would they be proving Paul was right? They would be proving Paul was wrong. It should be rejected. That's all they'd be proving. If they could prove that Jesus did away with the law, would they be proving that, Je that the law was done away with? No, they'd only be proving Jesus was a false messiah, a false prophet, because we start with Deuteronomy 13 and everything gets built on top of that. Exactly. How, why would they accept somebody that does away with everything that they've done for thousands and thousands of years that God specifically told them, don't reject, don't get away with it? A Torahless messiah is no messiah at all. Torahlessness, that's a whole other whole other topic. Um, so let's I mean, we could do that one too, maybe later, but <laughs> that's all another topic. Okay. Let's go ahead and Oh, okay. Okay, what's the custom here? Is this is this a good stopping point? Or a breaking point? How long have I been going? I don't want to bore people. I'm not boring you. Okay. Yeah, we know if you guys are snoring. Okay, well. Toralistness. Well, well, I have some ideas. I have some ideas, but I won't. She asked about the passage where Yeshua talks about the greatest in heaven being called greatest in heaven being called least in heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, which is not heaven, by the way. The kingdom of heaven is not heaven. Okay. <laughs> but that's not there. It's here. No, no. No, he goes to heaven to prepare a place for us. Um, now, now, 
after the millennial kingdom, the thousand years on earth, Paul says, no man knows what he has prepared for us. So I won't speak to what is after that, but during, there's two worlds to come. The term world to come is used to refer to the thousand year kingdom, and it's also used to refer to the infinite period after the thousand year kingdom. So, um, uh, all right, let's go to I'm trying to decide where to go because there's two different places I can do. But let's let's do this. Let's go to Revelation. Okay. I'm assuming that most of you here are not already familiar with a lot of my teachings that I've done. A lot of the teachings I've done already. Yeah. The majority, I, I'm assuming, are not. Okay. So this is something that some of you may, that are already familiar with things that I've taught you, go, oh, well, yeah, I know this. Um, okay. Let's start in Revelation chapter 10. We'll start at verse 1. And I saw another angel who descended from heaven and was clothed with a cloud and a bowl of, of heaven upon his head and his a, ba, a bow of heaven upon his head, not a bowl. He wasn't getting a haircut. <laughs> and his appearance like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. Uh, some of your translations will have feet, but uh, the, uh, the Aramaic word there, is um, regal, which can mean feet, but also can mean legs, and pillars are like legs, unless unless you're a poet like Longfellow, who put you to Longfellow. Anyway, he had in his hand a little open book, and he placed his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the land. I'm sorry? Oh, well, then actually there's a parallel. What does the sea represent? The Goyim. The nations. And who does Haaretz, the land, represent? Am Yisrael. Okay. And he cried out with a loud voice as a roaring lion. And when he had cried out, the seven thunders spoke their voices. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was preparing to write. And I heard a voice from heaven of the seven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it. So Yochanan hears what the seven thunders say, and he's really excited. And he wants to write this down. And Elohim says, No, don't write that down. <laughs> not yet. And the angel that I saw standing upon the sea and upon the land, who lifted his, uh, who lifted his hand to heaven, even he swore by him who lives forever and ever. He who created the heaven and that which is in it, and the earth is that, that which is in it, and the sea and that which is in it, that should not be any more time. I added the phrase in the sea because that's in, I think, most texts, but it's not in the Aramaic. And in the days of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of Eloah is completed, that he announced to his servants the prophets. Key verse here. In the days of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of Eloah is completed. What is the mystery of Eloah here? The mystery of Elohim here. In context, what's the mystery? John wanted to write it down. Whatever it was that the seventh thunder said. John wasn't allowed to write it down, but it will be revealed in the days of the seventh angel when he's about to sound. The mystery of Eloah is completed that he announced to his servants the prophets. Amos says, um, let's see if I, I may or may not have, there's a, pass, a verse in Amos, and I don't have the exact reference, but 
where he says uh, he will do nothing unless he tells his servants the prophets first. Okay. Um, okay. So the seventh angel is about to, about to sound, and the mystery is going to be revealed before the seventh angel sounds. There is a parallel with between this passage and one in Second Thessalonians, I think it is. Let me turn to Second Thessalonians, chapter two. I'm going by memory here, so my proof texts are all in my head. Yes, Second Thessalonians, chapter two. So what in in Revelation there, whatever the the thunder said would be revealed before the blowing of the seventh trumpet. How many trumpets are there in Revelation? Seven. So before the blowing of the final trumpet. By the way, I forgot to start. In, in, actually, I, I should have started. Uh, so let me kind of go back mentally. You guys are probably familiar. Revelation <laughs> chapter 6, in the opening of the seven seals. There's With the opening of the first seal, there's a thunder. And then what does he see? In Revelation 6, in the first seal. Somebody know? Anybody know? A man on a white horse. And what is the man on the white horse described? He has a bow in his hand. And what, what else on his head? A crown on his head and a bow in his hands. Okay, who is it? <laughs> the commentaries, the Christian commentaries are split. Like, uh, uh, I think Halley's says that it's, I can't remember which one is which, but Halley's and Unger's for uh, Bible handbooks are split. One of them says it's Jesus Christ. One of them says it's the Antichrist. So anyway, um, we're looking at we're, what we're going to be talking about today is the identity of the man on the white horse. Here's the guy on the white horse, and that's part of the mystery that would be revealed before the blowing of the final trumpet, right? Y'all follow follow the logic? Okay. And in Second Thessalonians chapter two, starting in verse one, but we urge you, my brothers, concerning the coming of our Adon, Yeshua the Messiah. And concerning our gathering together to him. Now Paul talks about an event, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, where he talks about our gathering together to Messiah, right? And when does that happen according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16? At the blowing of the final trumpet, right? At the blowing of the, of the final trumpet. You don't believe in the creature, right? I don't either. I don't either. This is a, a post-trip event. This is the end. Okay. So he says, um, uh, so he's referencing the time period that is synonymous with the blowing of the final trumpet. You understand that from this verse. Let's keep going. That you neither be quickly shaken in your minds, nor troubled, neither by word, nor by spirit, nor by a letter, as though from us, saying... Namely, behold, the day of our Adon has arrived. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, because it will not come except an apostasy should come first, and the Son of Man of Sin be revealed, the Son of Destruction. So who is revealed before the blowing of the final trumpet? The Son of Destruction, the Son of Sin, the, the Son of Destruction, the Man of Sin who is an adversary and exalts himself over all that is called a god and it is revered so that he will even sit in the temple of Eloa as Eloa and will make himself appear as though he is Eloa. So this um, uh, Torahless one, if you will, claims to be the god of the Bible. Right? Basically. Do you not remember that I was, while I was with you, I told these things to you? 
And now you know what restrains that he should be revealed in his time. Okay, so he's going to be, he's, it's going to be revealed, right, at a certain time. That time is before the blowing of the final trumpet, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he's about to sound. You follow? Is all fitting together? Okay. And what restrains that, re what restrains it from being revealed? Anybody? It's sealed. It's sealed. So can you see the parallel between what's being talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2 and in Revelation chapter 10? Fit together? And you know what restrains that he should be revealed this time. For the mystery of Torahlessness, iniquity, you'll have different translations. Yes. Sorry, I just did when you quoted that verse in Aramaic it was saying, and now you know it was strange until he be revealed in his time. Is that what it says there in his time? Yes. And the Greek says mist, which totally changes the way that that verse is interpreted. Because I'm reading that in the mm -hmm. Greek and I'm going, you know, I see why the Christian church pictures that as the you know, bird the you know, the Holy Ghost or whatever, but if it's in his time, totally different, you know, interpretation. Anyway. Okay, verse 7, for the mystery of Torahlessness, and the, let's talk about this word Torahlessness. The word here that appears in, in the Greek, um, in the, the Greek translation, if you will, but in the Greek, is anomia, which comes from anomos, which means, what's the Greek word for Torah? Nomos. And what is what does the Greek prefix a mean? Exactly. For example, symmetric. We have in English to symmetrical, asymmetrical. Okay. So you have Torah, nomos, and you have the opposite of Torah, Torahlessness, a nomos, a So it says for the mystery of a nomia, Torahlessness has already begun to work. However, it will work by itself when that which now restrains is taken away from the midst. And then the Torahless one, the Anomia one, will be revealed whom our Adon Yeshua the Messiah will consume by the breath of his mouth, and he will abolish him by the manifestation of his coming. The becoming of that one is by the working of Hasatan in all power, signs, and lying wonders. So this guy's going to have a great ministry... Signs, wonders, and miracles, you know. I heard somebody recently, they were talking about the, you know, um, there was actually a discussion on the Internet about, and I didn't, I, I didn't go there, you know. But somebody said, uh, well, talking about rising up of leadership and whatnot and trying to get organized. They said, well, I'll follow, a, you know, leadership when they can perform signs, wonders, and miracles. You know? Yeah. The next leader that's going to arise with signs, wonders, and miracles to verify his authenticity is this guy. And with all the deception of Torahlessness that is in the destroyed ones, because they did not receive the love of the truth. What is truth? Psalm 119, verse 142. Your Torah is truth. Verse 151, I think, all of his commandments are true. By which they should have life. Because of this, Eloah will send to them the working of deception that they might believe a lie. So if the Torah is truth, what is the lie? Torahlessness. If nomos is the truth, what is the lie? A nomos. And that all of them might be condemned, those who did not believe in the truth, but delighted in Torahlessness. But we are bound to give thanks to Eloah always on your behalf, our brothers, beloved of our Adon, that Eloah chose you from the beginning to life by the sanctification of the Spirit and by the trust of the truth. For these things he called you by our proclaiming to be glory for our dome, Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, my brother, stand fast and hold firmly to 
the Aramaic says the commandments, but interestingly, the Greek says the traditions that you learn, whether by word or by our letter. Now our Adon, Yeshua the Messiah, and the love of our Father, who loved us and gave to us eternal encouragement and good hope by his favor. Encourage your hearts and establish you in every word and in every good work. Okay. So let's see if we can find out more about this Torahless one uh, that uh, uh, has these signs, wonders, and miracles, and so on. Um, let's now turn to First Corinth, Second Corinthians, chapter ten, I believe. Verse, chapter 11, sorry, verse 4. Well, let's start verse 3. But I fear, lest as the serpent deceive Chava by his craftiness, so your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is with the Messiah. For if he who came towards you had proclaimed to you a, another Yeshua, whom he had not proclaimed, we had not proclaimed, or you had received another spirit that you had not received, or another good news or gospel that you had not accepted, you might have persuaded him well. So Paul here talks about another Yeshua, another Jesus or whatever. Okay? Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Put it all together. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Um, no, I'm sorry, verse uh, 20. And you, by their fruit, you will know them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, Adonai, Adonai, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same will enter with me into the kingdom of heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not eat and drink in your name? And have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out shadim, devils? And in your name done many powerful works or miracles? Remember now, we said in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, this guy's going to have signs, wonders, and miracles? By the way, we started up earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Earlier, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, what does Deuteronomy chapter 13 say? This guy comes along and he performs signs, wonders, and miracles, and he gives prophecies that come true every time, 100%. And he says not to follow the Torah? Reject him. Which implies that such a one will come. And then I will profess to them then I know them not. Depart from me, all you workers of anomia, Torahlessness, the same word there. So these guys believed in a different guy. Same name, but a totally different figure. Torahless one. So we come back to do to Revelation chapter 6, the guy on the white horse, who is he? Half the commentaries say it's Jesus Christ. Half the commentaries say that it's the Antichrist. Guess what? They're both right. <laughs> They're both right. The Torahless version of Jesus that came to free you from the bondage of the law is the other Jesus, the Torahless one. Okay. Okay. Notice that the guy on the white horse 
What was he armed with? Okay. Now we do see um, Messiah pictured in Revelation chapter 19 on a white horse. Sorry, I need to make sure that that's on in case my wife calls me. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, we see uh, uh, Revelation chapter 19, the Messiah is on a white horse uh, at his return. And what is he armed with? A sword that comes out of his mouth. He's armed with a sword. What does the sword represent? The word. And what is the word? The Torah. The Torah is the word. Okay. So the Messiah, when he really comes back, he's armed with a with the Torah, right? But this other guy doesn't have a sword, therefore he is without the Torah, Torahless. Instead, he comes with a bow and a crown upon his head, which reveals who he truly is. Does anybody know? Nimrod, the hunter king. Nimrod, the hunter king, the king of Babylon. Okay? Now, you notice that this guy, according to Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's destroyed by the breath of the Messiah, by the Torah. The Messiah, the Torah, destroys him. Um, he also parallels the figure in, in uh, Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, we read about a beast, right? Which parallel, parallels the same figure because the beast, sign, wonders, and miracles... Uh, declares himself to be Elohim and and so on, right? And um, but you notice something interesting about this beast in Revelation chapter 13 that just seems to go over a lot of people's heads. He's a dead and resurrected god that the whole world worships. <laughs> okay, and. The beast in Revelation chapter 13 that crawls out from the sea, right, comes up from the, from the sea and comes up from the goyim, okay? And what what this beast, if you do a little study in Revelation, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, it's a composite of the, of the four beasts in Daniel 7, right? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's from, it's the, well, the fourth beast is the combination, there's a connection, we won't go there right now, but yeah, there is a connection there. But the the he's a four, uh, he's a composite of the four beasts. Okay, where else do we see a composite of the four beasts in Daniel chapter seven? What in Daniel chapter seven? What do the four beasts represent? Four kingdoms. Where else does Daniel have a uh, there's a vision a, a statue right that has the same four kingdoms right and so the statue is the statue of a man. We're not told who the man is. But it's the statue of a man that, that is the same composite as, do you see what I'm saying now? So it's therefore the statue is the anti-Messiah. Or symbolic of the anti-Messiah. But the statue of the man is destroyed by what? A stone, what? Cut out of what? Cut out of a mountain without human hands, right? When was a stone cut out of a mountain without human hands? The Torah. Sinai. The Torah was, so he's destroyed by the Torah. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments, rotten tomatoes? <laughs> well, I would, I would say that the only prophecy that Daniel had was the the metals of the statue are actually very significant. Let me explain. Gold gold in alchemy represents the sun, and Babylon was sun worship a sun worshiping culture. Okay, the next metal is silver. And in alchemy, silver represents the moon, and the Persians were a moon-worshipping culture. And then you get down to the to the Greeks, and the Greek Greeks are what? Bronze or brass, copper, okay. 
they're all the same word in Hebrew, by the way. Bronze, brass, and copper are on the chash in Hebrew. And copper in alchemy represents, anybody know? Hey, no. Venus or Aphrodite. And the Greeks were Aphrodite worshippers. Okay? And then the next, the next metal down is iron. And iron in alchemy represents Mars. And the Romans were God of War, Mars worshippers. So, yeah, it's extremely prophetic even in the metals that the statue is made from. And Rome, by the, well, by the way, talking about Daniel 2 and 7, in Daniel 2, the statue terminates in the ten, to in ten toes, right? Each civilization fell to the next, right? Um, Babylon fell to Persia. Persia fell to Greece. Greece fell to Rome. And then Rome fell to who? Okay. Let's come back to it in a second, but yeah, you're on exactly the right track. Let's go to the Daniel 7. Daniel 7, the fourth beast terminates in seven in 12 horns. Uh, 10 horns, I'm sorry, 10 horns. Okay, So, again, each kingdom falls to the next, and you have 10 horns instead of 10 toes. So, they, you were naming all these different groups, um, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Gauls, and so on. Um, they were who? The barbarians of Europe, right? Who were the barbarians of Europe at this time? At this, at the first in the, in the in, well, even before the first century, in the during this time, before the first century, who were the barbarians of Europe in the first? Well, actually, past the first century, at the time Rome fell, who were the barbarians? The, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Gauls. Who were these people? Well, the Vikings were um, um, uh, the last ten tribes, the ten toes, the ten horns, the ten. And what's interesting is also that after the Roman Empire, the ten toe empire, if you will, the ten horn empire rules the world until the return of the Messiah, right? Well, that's, there's all kinds of different possible interpretations. And by the way, there can be multiple right ones, by the way. Now, I'll, I'll cover something kind of interesting about all that. But here's the, another interesting thing. Is, who has ruled the world from the fall of the Roman Empire to this very day? Who dominates the world? The barbarians of Europe. <laughs> who colonized the United States and Australia and whatnot, but... Okay. Now you were talking about the three and the, 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 the ten horns and then three horns. And the ten horns um, overcome, overcome three horns. You know, yeah, it devours, the, it devours three horns. It's not, the, it's not three of the ten. If the ten horns represent the ten tribes, who do the three horns represent? Who, do the, who would the three horns represent? If the ten horns represent the ten tribes, the other three tribes, which are the house of Judah and, and Judah. So then the, the, uh, the ten tribe kingdom will invade Israel. Now here's personally what I see happening. So, yeah, so uh, here's what I personally see happening at some point in the future. Uh, and, and it could be well off, although events happen that make, start to make it seem soon, close at hand. Everybody's concerned about Islam. Okay? In my opinion, Islam is not the big bad guy. It's the immediate big bad guy. Don't get me wrong. And it's a nasty bad guy. But it's the king of the south. 
it actually is the figure that gives the king of the north more power. The king, okay? Israel was this little country that was caught between two kingdoms, the king of the north and the king of the south. Who was the king of, okay, the king of the south was Egypt, right? The, and there were two world empires at the time. There was the, the civilizations that grew up around, the civilization that grew up around the Nile, okay? And the civilization that grew up around the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia, okay? Which Babylon, basically, in various incarnations, right? Right? Babylon, okay? Later, the, uh, um, during the Maccabean period, the king of the north was Antiochus Epiphanes, and the king of the south, in fact, that's what Daniel uh, seems to be really talking about, is the conflicts between the, the Seleucid Empire in Egypt and the, uh, um, uh, the Antiochus Epiphanes and the, the uh, um, I forget what the name of the empire was right now, but the Greco-Syrian Empire, basically, in the north. Okay. Now, um, who is Babylon today? Modern Babylon. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I would put forth. Oh yeah, I would put forth that Babylon is Christianity. Okay, well, the King of the North is the North, basically the Christian world, and the King of the South is the Islamic world. And there's this big conflict that takes place between the King of the North and the King of the South in the last days. Okay, the King of the North. Another example of why the King of the North is Christianity. The King of the North in uh, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, is really, if you study it, talking about the uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the uh, um, uh, the Greco-Syrian Empire, right? In fact, even the, there's um, uh, the uh, Abomination of Desolation, for example, is the direct parallel in Antiochus Epiphanes slaughtering a pig on the altar and so on, right? Which is, by the way, your Christmas, uh, your Christmas ham. Okay, because it goes back to Nimrod. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nimrod, Nimrod was killed by what? A boar, and so Nimrod demanded um, the his favorite sacrifice, if you will, the favorite sacrifice to Nimrod was the boar. In retaliation, if you will. Okay, and that's why Antiochus Epiphanes was slaughtering a pig on the altar, and that's where your Christmas ham comes from. Okay, now uh, all the customs and practices of modern Christianity are are those of ancient Babylon, Christmas and Easter, and you know what steeples are, right? Yeah, all that stuff is right out. Okay. The names have been changed to protect the guilty. Okay, um, so that's the king of the north, and the king of the uh, and, and the king of the south, and the king of the north are at war with each other. Now, I think what happens is that a peace treaty will be uh, forced upon Israel by. And the King of the North, by the way, has control of the United Nations, which is how the apparent conflict between various prophecies fits together, because in Zechariah, all the nations of the world surround Jerusalem. I think that there will be a peace treaty uh, negotiated by the King of the North, and that as part of this peace treaty, I think, because it's been talked about, that all the holy sites will be placed under the authority of the Vatican. And the Vatican will then take the Temple Mount, and by this time there will at least be sacrifices and offerings taking place on an altar there if the temple hasn't actually been rebuilt. 
And the Vatican will say, well, Jesus did away with the sacrifices and offerings, and this is the temple of Jesus. And there you have the abomination of desolation. That's just what I'm, I'm thinking, okay? Um, also, a scary thought is if a figure with a, 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 in a Roman toga with, um, uh, that looked like the traditional Jesus descended out of the sky and said, hey, I'm Jesus Christ. I returned. There are billions of people on this planet that would do anything he said. Yes. They're, yeah, Esau. In connection with the Mahdi. Yes. So, And... Hinduism is expecting the tenth incarnation of Vishnu, and uh, so on. I mean, so okay. Anyway, so all right. Well, that's just my my thoughts on last day's events. I'm not a prophet. I'm not declaring that to be it. It's just my thoughts. Um, interestingly, um, tomorrow begins the feast of Yeshua. Chag Yeshua. The Chag Yeshua story is in uh, 3rd Maccabees. Okay? Um, the four books of the Maccabees follow each of the four levels inter of interpretation. The first is, I don't know if you guys know the four levels. Peshat, which is the literal. The remez is the uh, implied, hinted. The drosh is the allegorical or homiletical. And the sod is the hidden secret or mystical level, right? Four levels. Each of the four Gospels are written on each of those four levels. You guys know that, hopefully. Uh, maybe you don't. But okay. Um, okay, I'll quickly hit it. Mark gives the peshat, the plain literal meaning. Luke digs into the details and gives the remez. Matthew tells the story as a midrash, constantly referring back to the the scriptures and giving interpretations of the, as as interpretations of the text, uh, homily, homily, allegorical. Okay, and then Yochanan gives the hidden secret or mystical level. Okay, the four books of the Maccabees. The first book of the Maccabees gives the plain simple story. Okay, the second book digs into the details. Uh, the third book of the Maccabees hits the allegorical level of understanding because it has nothing to do with the Maccabees. It has to do with an earlier situation that took place in Egypt about 50 years before the Hanukkah story. And then the fourth book is the hidden secret and mystical level. It goes into how the martyrs of the Hanukkah story were able to endure their sufferings because they had the Torah in their wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and so on. So it's like the Tanya; it's really deep. But um, let me back up to the third Maccabees because that's where the well. Let's talk about Hanukkah real quick. Hanukkah is a picture of last days events. You know, sometimes when I bring up the extra uh, the, the festival of Hanukkah, there's those that say, "Oh, well, that's not in the Torah," or you know, whatever. But and then they'll say. So one of the things that has come up is that, well, the Torah festivals are all lay out the future and everything in prophecy. Well, none of them lay it out so well as the, as, uh, the Hanukkah story. See, in the Hanukkah story, the abomination of desolation takes place when the king of the north comes down and slaughters a pig on the altar. And that creates a three-and-a-half-year period. Uh, or a three-year period, sorry, a three-year period, um, a th no, three-and-a-half, sorry, three-and-a-half-year period, um, where Israel is in the wilderness. Judas Maccabee and, 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 and the others escape out into the wilderness, just like we see in the Revelation. And they spend this time in the wilderness, and then when they return, the uh, Judas Maccabee, who represents the Messiah, Judah, comes back, and becomes both priest and king, and the temple is rededicated, and they celebrate Sukkot again for the first time, 
And Sukkot represents the Millennial Kingdom, so it represents the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. And when they find the temple, they find that something that represents the remnant. They find that um, uh, only one canister of the sacred oil, okay, that still has the seal of the high priest on it, just like the remnant have the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the oil represents the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. And um, so there's just so much. I mean, I could go into more and more and more, but you see how it all ties together, right? Okay, now, if that's what happens with the king of the north, what happens with the king of the south? Remember I said 3rd Maccabees deals with something that happened about 50 years earlier in Egypt. And what happened is that the king of the south, okay, um, his name escapes me right now, uh, the king of the... Um, Ptolemy, Ptolemy the Fourth. Ptolemy the Fourth uh, has just uh, reconquered the land of Israel, and was his custom when he won a big war to try and make friendly, make nice with the new inhabitants, to go to their temple, their customary temple, and to give sacrifices to the local gods. And so he rides into Jerusalem says, I want to give sacrifices to your your deity here. Um, so they said, okay, so he comes to the temple. He's so he's really impressed with the temple there. It's amazing. He wants to see the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> so no, no, no. Even the high priest can't go into the Holy of Holies. Except once a year. You can't go there. Oh, no, no, no. I'm the king. I just conquered this land. I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> I want to go see this thing. No, 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 you can't. I Okay. So he did. Well, he tried to. Every time he approached it, he would become, he would uh, go unconscious, pass out. He couldn't get in. He was getting angry. And uh, But there wasn't anything to do. It. He could, literally, could not go in. He could not get in. So finally... He was angry, and he swore a few words, and uh, swore a few words against the Jews, basically. And he headed home with the mission of killing every Jew in his empire, uh, at least back down in Egypt. So he goes back down to Egypt, and he signs a decree uh, to kill all the Jews. To, to, well, he starts sign, signing decrees outlawing Judaism, and um, uh, anyway, he, he sets a day to kill all the Jews. He has them all uh, report, and um, uh, long story short, Elohim intervenes, and his plans fail. The Jewish people are saved, and there was a festival established as a result of that, and that festival became known as the Feast of Yeshua. Sometime after the first century, uh, mainline Judaism quit celebrating the festival called the Feast of Yeshua, I wonder why. Okay. And so, uh, um, and it starts tomorrow on wedding day. Okay. So uh, what is my point backing up? Why did I bring all this up other than tomorrow starts the feast? Is that there is a place in prophecy. Shortly before the last days, before the events that we see then that we just talked about, there is uh, another symbolic parallel because... The king of the south, Islam, the Islamic world, wants access to the Temple Mount and can't get it. And when they can't get it, they want to kill all the Jews. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's it. I'll go ahead and turn, turn things over to whoever. Oh, we're done. All right. Shalom, shalom. Shavuot tov.